freshmen, it's Ms. Matthews again. Uh, we are on now chapter four of, of Mice and Men. So just like last time, I'm going to read aloud, but instead of telling you what to annotate, I'll ask questions, and then the answers to those questions are what you are writing in the margin. All right, chapter four. Crooks, the Negro stable buck, had his bunk in the harness room, a little shed that leaned off the wall of the barn. On one side of the little room, there was a square four-paned window, and on the other, a narrow plank door leading into the barn. Crook's bunk was a long box filled with straw on which his blankets were flung. On the wall by the window, there were pegs on which hung broken harness in process of being mended, strips of new leather, and under the window itself, a little bench for leather working tools, curved knives and needles and balls of linen thread, and a small hand riveter. On pegs were also pieces of harness, a split collar with the horsehair stuffing sticking out, a broken hem, and a trace chain with its leather covering split. Crooks had his apple box over his bunk, and in it a range of medicine bottles, both for himself and for the horses. There were cans of saddle soap and a drippy can of tar with its paintbrush sticking over the edge, and scattered about the floor were a number of personal possessions. For being alone, Crooks could leave his things about, and being a stable buck and a cripple, he was more permanent than the other men, and he had accumulated more possessions than he could carry on his back. Crooks possessed several pairs of shoes, a pair of rubber boots, a big alarm clock, and a single-barreled shotgun. And he had books, too, a tattered dictionary and a mauled copy of the California Civil Code for 1905. There were battered magazines and a few dirty books on a special shelf above his bunk. A pair of large, gold-rimmed spectacles hung from a nail on the wall above his bed. So let's stop here, and I want you to annotate what's the difference between Crooks' living quarters and the bunkhouse where the rest of the men stay. What are some of the details and how is it different? Why do you think it's different? The room was swept and fairly neat for Crooks was a proud, aloof man. He kept his distance and demanded that other people keep theirs. His body was bent over to the left by his crooked spine and his eyes lay deep in his head and because of their depth seemed to glitter with intensity. His lean face was lined with deep black wrinkles and he had thin pain tightened lips which were lighter than his face. It was Saturday night. Through the open door that led into the barn came the sound of moving horses, of feet stirring, of teeth champing on hay, of the rattle of halter chains. In the stable buck's room, a small electric globe threw a meager yellow light. Crooks sat on his bunk. His shirt was out of his jeans in the back. In one hand, he held a bottle of liniment and with the other, he rubbed his spine. Now and then he poured a few drops of the liniment into his pink palmed hand and reached up under his shirt to rub again. He flexed his muscles against his back and shivered. Just take a moment and summarize that last paragraph. What's happening right there? Noiselessly, Lenny appeared in the open doorway and stood there looking in, his big shoulders nearly filling the opening. For a moment, Crooks did not see him, but on raising his eyes, he stiffened and a scowl came on his face. His hand came out from under his shirt. Lenny smiled helplessly in an attempt to make friends. Crooks said sharply, you got no right to come in my room. This here's my room. Nobody got any right in here but me. Lenny gulped and his smile grew more fawning. I ain't doing nothing, he said. Just come to look at my puppy and I seen your light, he explained. Well, I got a right to have a light. You go on, get out of my room. I ain't wanted in the bunkhouse and you ain't wanted in my room. Why ain't you wanted, Lenny asked. Cause I'm black. They play cards in there, but I can't play cause I'm black. They say I stink. Well, I tell you, all of you stink to me. Lenny flapped his big hands helplessly. Everybody went in town, he said. Slim and George and everybody. George says I gotta stay here and not get in no trouble. I seen your light. Well, what do you want? Nothing. I seen your light. I thought I could just come in and sit. So stop a moment. I want you to think about how does Crooks react to Lenny showing up in his doorway like that? And why do you think Crooks reacts that way? Crooks stared at Lenny and he reached behind him and took down the spectacles and adjusted them over his pink ears and stared again. I don't know what you're doing in the barn anyway, he complained. You ain't no Skinner. There's no call for a bucker to come into the barn at all. You ain't no Skinner. You ain't got nothing to do with the horses. The pup, Lenny repeated. I come to see my pup. 
Well, go see your pup then. Don't come in a place where you're not wanted. Lenny lost his smile. He advanced a step into the room, then remembered and backed to the door again. I looked at him a little. Slim says I ain't to pet him very much. Crook said, well, you've been taking him out of the nest all the time. I wonder the old lady don't move him someplace else. The old lady means the mother dog. Oh, she don't care. She lets me. Lenny had moved into the room again. Crook scowled, but Lenny's disarming smile defeated him. Come on in and sit a while, Crook said. As long as you won't get out and leave me alone, you might as well sit down. His tone was a little more friendly. All the boys gone into town, huh? All but old Candy. He just sits in the bunkhouse, sharpening his pencil and sharpening and figuring. Crooks adjusts his glasses. Figuring? What's Candy figuring about? Lenny almost shouted, about the rabbits. You're nuts, said Crook. You're as crazy as a wedge. What rabbits are you talking about? The rabbits we're going to get, and I get to tend them, cut grass and give them water and like that. Just nuts, said Crooks. I don't blame the guy you travel with for keeping you out of sight. Lenny said quietly, it ain't no lie. We're going to do it. Going to get a little place and live on the fat of the land. Crook settled himself more comfortably on his bunk. Set down, he invited. Set down on the nail keg. Lenny hunched down on the little barrel. You think it's a lie, Lenny said. But it ain't no lie. Every word's the truth and you can ask George. Crooks put his dark chin into his pink palm. You travel around with George, don't you? Crooks, uh, sure. Me and him goes every place together. Crooks continued. Sometimes he talks and you don't know what the hell he's talking about. Ain't that so? He leaned forward, boring Lenny with his deep eyes. Ain't that so? Yeah, sometimes. Just talks on, and you don't know what the hell it's about. Yeah, sometimes, but not always. Crooks leaned forward over the edge of the bunk. I ain't a Southern Negro, he said. I was born right here in California. My old man had a chicken ranch, about 10 acres. The white kids come to play at our place, and sometimes I went to play with them, and some of them was pretty nice. My old man didn't like that. I never knew till long later why he didn't like that but I know now. He hesitated, and when he spoke, his voice was softer. There wasn't another colored family with a... <laughs> there wasn't another colored family for miles round, and now there ain't a colored man on this ranch, and there's just one family in Soledad. He laughed. If I say something, why, it's just a black man saying it. So let's stop right there. Two questions. First of all, why is this memory of the way Crooks grew up important? And second of all, what does he mean by that last sentence? If I say something, why it's just a black man saying it, right? And you can see the word on the page. What does he mean by that? Lenny asked, how long do you think it'll be before them pups will be old enough to pet? Crooks laughed again. A guy can talk to you and be sure you won't go blabbing. Couple of weeks and them pups will be all right. George knows what he's about. Just talks and you don't understand nothing. He leaned forward excitedly. This is just a black man talking and a busted back black man. So it don't mean nothing, see? You couldn't remember it anyways. I seen it over and over. A guy talking to another guy and it don't make no difference if you don't hear or understand. The thing is they're talking or they're setting, still not talking. It don't make no difference, no difference. His excitement had increased until he pounded his knee with his hand. George can tell you screwy things and it don't matter. It's just the talking. It's just being with another guy. That's all. He paused. His voice grew soft and persuasive. Suppose George don't come back no more. Suppose he took a powder and just ain't coming back. What do you do then? Lenny's attention came gradually to what had been said. What? He demanded. I said, suppose George went into town tonight and you never heard of him no more. Crooks pressed forward some kind of private victory. Just suppose that, he repeated. He won't do it, Lenny cried. George wouldn't do nothing like that. I've been with George a long time. He'll come back tonight. But the doubt was too much for him. Don't you think he will? Crooks' face lighted with pleasure in his torture. Nobody can't tell what a guy will do, he observed calmly. Let's say he wants to come back and can't. Let's suppose he gets killed or hurt so he can't come back. Lenny struggled to understand. 
George won't do nothing like that, he repeated. George is careful. He won't get hurt. He ain't never been hurt because he's careful. Well, suppose, just suppose he don't come back. What do you do then? Lenny's face wrinkled with apprehension. I don't know. Say, what you doing anyways, he cried. This ain't true. George ain't got hurt. Crooks bored in on him. Want me to tell you what that, what'll happen? They'll take you to the booby hatch. They'll tie you up with a collar like a dog. Suddenly, Lenny's eyes centered and grew quiet and mad. He stood up and walked dangerously close to Crooks. Who hurt George, he demanded. Crooks saw the danger as it approached him. <clears throat> he edged back on his bunk to get out of the way. I was just supposing, he said, George ain't hurt. He's all right. He'll be back tonight. He'll be back all right. Lenny stood over him. What you supposing for? Ain't nobody going to suppose no hurt to George. Crooks removed his glasses and wiped his eyes with his fingers. Just sit down, he said. George ain't hurt. All right, let's stop. Why does Crooks do that to Lenny? Why does he do that? That's mean. Why does he do it? What's his point? Lenny growled back to his seat on the nail keg. Ain't nobody going to talk no hurt to George, he grumbled. Crook said gently, maybe you can see now. You got George. You know he's going to come back. Suppose you didn't have nobody. Suppose you couldn't go into the bunkhouse and play rummy because you was black. How'd you like that? Suppose you had to sit out here and read books. Sure, you could play horseshoes till it got dark, but then you got to read books. Books ain't no good. A guy needs somebody to be near him. He whined. A guy goes nuts if he ain't got nobody. Don't make no difference who the guy is as long as he's with you. I tell you, he cried. I tell you, a guy gets too lonely and he gets sick. Stop right there for a minute. What's Crook's life like? And what does he mean by that last sentence? I tell you, a guy gets too lonely and he gets sick. George gonna come back, Lenny reassured himself in a frightened voice. Maybe George come back already. Maybe I better go see. Crook said, I didn't mean to scare you. He'll come back. I was talking about myself. The guy sits alone out here at night, maybe reading books or thinking or stuff like that. Sometimes he gets thinking and he got nothing to tell him what's so and what ain't so. Maybe if he sees something, he don't know whether it's right or not. He can't turn to some other guy and ask him if he sees it too. He can't tell. He got nothing to measure by. I seen things out here. I wasn't drunk. I don't know if I was asleep. If some guy was with me, he could tell me I was asleep and then it would be all right. But I just don't know. Crooks was looking across the room now, looking toward the window. Lenny said miserably, George won't go away and leave me. I know George won't do that. The stable buck went on dreamily. I remember when I was a little kid on my old man's ranch, chicken ranch, had two brothers. They was always near me, always there. Used to sleep right in the same room, right in the same bed, all three. Had a strawberry patch, had an alfalfa patch. Used to turn the chickens out in the alfalfa on a sunny morning. My brothers sat on a fence rail and watch them. White chickens, they was. Gradually, Lenny's interest came around to what was being said. George says, we're going to have alfalfa for the rabbits. What rabbits? We're going to have rabbits and a berry patch. You're nuts. We are too, you asked George. You're nuts. Crooks was scornful. I seen hundreds of men come by on the road and on the ranches with their bindles on their backs and that same damn thing in their heads. Hundreds of them. They come and they quit and go on and every damn one of them's got a little piece of land in his head. And never a goddamn one of them ever gets it, just like heaven. Everybody wants a little piece of land. I read plenty of books out here. Nobody never gets to heaven and nobody gets no land. It's just in their head. They're all the time talking about it, but it's just in their head. Stop for a second. I want you to summarize what Crooks just said right there. He paused and looked toward the open door for the horses were moving restlessly and the halter chains clinked. A horse whinnied. I guess somebody's out there, Crook said. Maybe Slim. Slim comes in sometimes two or three times a night. Slim's a real skinner. He looks out for his team. He pulled himself painfully upright and moved toward the door. That you, Slim? He called. Candy's voice answered. Slim went in town. Say, you seen Lenny? You mean the big guy? Yeah, seen him around any place? He's in here, Crook said shortly. He went back to his bunk and lay down.
Candy stood in the doorway, scratching his bald wrist and looking blindly into the lighted room. He made no attempt to enter. Tell you what, Lenny, I've been figuring about them rabbits, Crook said irritably. You can come in if you want. Candy seemed embarrassed. I don't know, of course, if you want me to. Come on in. Everybody's coming in. You might just as well. It was difficult for Crooks to conceal his pleasure with anger. Candy came in, but he was still embarrassed. You've got a nice, cozy little place here, he said to Crooks. Must be nice to have a room all to yourself this way. Sure, said Crooks, and a manure pile under the window. Sure, it's swell. Lenny broke in. You said about them rabbits. Candy leaned against the wall beside the broken collar while he scratched the wrist stump. I've been here a long time, he said, and Crook's been here a long time. This is the first time I ever been in this room. Crook said darkly, darkly, guys don't come into a colored man's room very much. Nobody been here but Slim. Slim and the boss. Candy quickly changed the subject. Slim's as good a skinner as I ever seen. Lenny leaned toward the old swamper. About them rabbits, he insisted. Candy smiled. I got it figured out. We can make some money on them rabbits if we go about it, right? But I get to tend them, Lenny broke in. George says, I get to tend them. He promised. Crooks interrupted brutally. You guys is just kidding yourself. You talk about it a hell of a lot, but you won't get no land. You'll be a swamper here till they take you out in a box. Hell, I seen too many guys. Lenny here will quit and be on the road in two, three weeks. Seems like every guy got land in his head. Candy rubbed his cheek angrily. You goddamn right we're going to do it. George says we are. We got the money right now. Yeah, said Crooks. And where's George now? In town, in a whorehouse. That's where your money's going. Jesus, I've seen it happen too many times. I've seen too many guys with land in their head. They never get none under their hand. What does he mean? And he keeps saying they got land in their head. Candy cried. Sure they all want it. Everybody wants a little bit of land. Not much. Just something that was his. Something he could live on and there couldn't nobody throw him off of it. I never had none. I planted crops for damn near everybody in this state, but they wasn't my crops. And when I harvest them, it wasn't none of my harvest. But we're going to do it now. And it don't make no mistake about that. George ain't got the money in town. That money's in the bank. Me and Lenny and George. We're going to have a room to ourselves. We're going to have a dog and rabbits, and chickens. We're going to have green corn and maybe a cow or a goat. He stopped, overwhelmed with his picture. Crooks asked, you say you got the money? Damn right. We, we got most of it. Just a little bit more to get. Have it all in one month. George got the land all picked out, too. Crooks reached around and explored his spine with his hand. I never really, I never seen a guy really do it, he said. I seen guys nearly crazy with loneliness for land, but every time a whorehouse or a blackjack game took what it takes, he hesitated. If you guys would want a hand to work for nothing, just as keep, why, I'd come and lend a hand. I ain't so crippled I can't work like a son of a bitch if I want to. Any of you boys seen Curly? They swung their heads toward the door. Looking in was Curly's wife. Her face was heavily made up. Her lips were slightly parted. She breathed strongly as though she'd been running. Curly ain't been here, Candy said sourly. She stood, stood still in the doorway, smiling a little at them, rubbing the nails of one hand with a thumb and forefinger of another, and her eyes traveled from one face to another. They left all the weak ones here, she said finally. Think I don't know where they all went? Even Curly? I know where they all went. Lenny watched her, fascinated. But Candy and Crooks were scowling down away from her eyes. Candy said, then if you know, why you want to ask us where Curly's at? She regarded them amusedly. Funny thing, she said, if I catch any one man and he's alone, I get along fine with him. But just let two of the guys get together and you won't talk. Just nothing but mad. She dropped her fingers and put her hands on her hips. You're all scared of each other, that's what. Every one of you is scared the rest is going to get something on you. After a pause, Crook said, maybe you better go along to your own house now. We don't want no trouble. Well, I ain't giving you no trouble. Think I don't like to talk to somebody every once in a while? Think I like to stick in that house all the time? Candy laid the stump of his wrist on his knee and rubbed it gently with his hand. He said accusingly, you got a husband. You got no call fooling around with other guys causing trouble. The girl flared up. Sure, I got a husband. You all seen him. Swell guy, ain't he? 
spends all his time saying what he's going to do to guys he don't like, and he don't like nobody. Think I'm going to stay in that two by four house and listen to how Curly's going to lead with his left twig and then bring in the old right cross? One, two, he says, just the old one, two, one, two, and he'll go down. She paused and her face lost its sullenness and grew interested. Say, what happened to Curly's hand? There was an embarrassed silence. Candy stole a look at Lenny. Then he coughed. Why, Curly got his hand caught in a machine, ma'am. Bust his hand. She watched for a moment and she laughed. Baloney. What you think you're selling me? Curly started something he didn't finish. Caught in a machine. Baloney. Why, he ain't give nobody the good old one-two since he got his hand bust. Who bust him? Candy repeated sullenly. Got it caught in a machine. All right, she said contemptuously. All right, cover him up if you want it. What do I care? You bindle bums think you're so damn good. What do you think I am, a kid? I tell you, I could have went with shows, not just one neither. And a guy told me he could put me in pictures. So she has dreams of being an actress. That's what she's talking about there. She was breathless with indignation. Saturday night, everybody out doing something. Everybody, and what am I doing standing here talking to a bunch of bindle stiffs? A black man and a dum-dum and a lousy old sheep. And liking it because they ain't nobody else. Lenny watched her, his mouth half open. Crooks had retired into the terrible protective dignity of the Negro. But a change came over old Candy. He stood up suddenly and knocked his nail keg over backward. I had enough, he said angrily. You ain't wanted here. We told you you ain't. And I tell you, you got floozy ideas about what us guys amount to. You ain't got sense enough in that chicken head to even see we ain't stiffs. Suppose you get us can. Suppose you do. You think we'll hit the highway and look for another lousy two-bit job like this? You don't know that we got our own ranch to go to in our own house. We ain't got to stay here. We got a house and chickens and fruit trees and a place a hundred times prettier than this. And we got friends. That's what we got. Maybe there was a time when we was scared of getting canned, but we ain't no more. We got our own land and it's ours and we can go to it. Curly's wife laughed at him. Baloney, she said. I've seen too many, you guys. If you had two bits in the world, why, you'd be getting two shots of corn with it and sucking the bottom of the glass. I know you guys. Candy's face had grown redder and redder, but before she was done speaking, he had control of himself. He was the master of the situation. I might have knew, he said gently. Maybe you just better go along and roll your hoop. That's a reference to her age. Rolling a hoop was a kid's game. We ain't got nothing to say to you at all. We know what we got. We don't care whether you know it or not. So maybe you j better just scatter along now because Curly maybe ain't going to like his wife out here in the barn with us bindle stiffs. She looked from one face to another and they were all closed against her. And she looked longest at Lenny until he dropped his eyes of embarrassment. Suddenly she said, where'd you get them bruises on your face? Lenny looked up guiltily. Who, me? Yeah, you. Lenny looked to Candy for help, and then he looked at his lap again. He got his hand caught in a machine, he said. <laughs> Curly's wife laughed. Okay, machine. I'll talk to you later. I like machines. Stop a second. What just happened there? What did Lenny just do by accident? Candy broke in. You let this guy alone. Don't you do no messing around with him. I'm going to tell George what you says. George won't have you messing with Lenny. Who's George, she asked. The little guy you come with? Lenny smiled happily. That's him, he said. That's the guy, and he's going to let me tend the rabbits. Well, if that's all you want, I might get a couple rabbits myself. Crook stood up from his bunk and faced her. I had enough, he said coldly. You got no rights coming in a colored man's room. You got no rights messing around here at all. Now you just get out and get out quick. If you don't, I'm going to ask the boss not to ever let you come in the barn no more. She turned on him in scorn. Listen, she said, you know what I can do to you if you open your trap. Crook stared hopelessly at her, and then he sat down on his bunk and drew into himself. She closed in on him. You know what I could do? Crook seemed to grow smaller, and he pressed himself against the wall. Yes, ma'am. Well, you keep your place then. I could get you strung up on a tree so easy it ain't even funny. Crooks had reduced himself to nothing. There was no personality, no ego, nothing to arouse either like or dislike. He said, yes, ma'am, and his voice was toneless.
So what just happened right there? It was ugly. We saw a very ugly side of Curly's wife. Explain in your own words there what just happened. For a moment, she stood over him as though waiting for him to move so that she could whip at him again, but Crook sat perfectly still, his eyes averted, everything that might be hurt drawn in. She turned at last to the other two. Old Candy was watching her, fascinated. If you was to do that, we'd tell, he said quietly. We'd tell about you framing Crooks. Tell and I'll be damned, she cried. Nobody listened to you and you know that. Nobody listened to you. Candy subsided. No, he agreed. Nobody'd listen to us. Lenny whined. I wish George was here. I wish George was here. Candy stepped over to him. Don't you worry, none, he said. I just heard the guys coming in. George will be in the bunkhouse right now, I bet. He turned to Curly's wife. You better go home now, he said quietly. If you go right now, we won't tell Curly you was here. She appraised him coolly. I ain't sure you heard nothing. Better not take no chances, he said. If you ain't sure, you better take the safe way. She turned to Lenny. I'm glad you bust up Curly a little bit. He got it coming to him. Sometimes I'd like to bust him myself. She slipped out the door and disappeared into the dark barn. And while she went through the barn, the halter chains rattled and some horses snorted and some stamped their feet. Crooks seemed to come slowly out of the layers of protection he had put on. Was that the truth? What you said about the guys come back, he asked. Sure, I heard him. Well, I didn't hear nothing. The gate banged, Candy said, and he went on. Jesus Christ, Curly's wife can move quiet. I guess she had a lot of practice, though. Crooks avoided the whole subject now. Maybe you guys better go, he said. I ain't sure I want you in here no more. A colored man gotta have some rights, even if you don't like him. Candy said, that bitch didn't oughta said that to you. It wasn't nothing, Crooks said dully. You guys coming in and setting made me forget. What she says was true. Stop right there. What does he mean there? What does he mean that them coming in and set made him forget? Made him forget what? And what did he remember? The horses snorted out in the barn and the chains rang and a voice called, Lenny, oh, Lenny, you in the barn? It's George, Lenny cried. And he answered, here, George, I'm, I'm right in here. In a second, George stood framed in the door and he looked disapprovingly about, what you doing in Crooks' room? You hadn't ought to be in here. Crooks nodded. I told them, but they come in anyways. Well, why don't you kick them out? I didn't care much, said Crooks. Lenny's a nice fella. Now Candy aroused himself. Oh, George, I've been figuring and figuring. I got it doped out how we can even make some money on them rabbits. George scowled. I thought I told you not to tell nobody about that. Candy was crestfallen. Didn't tell nobody but Crooks. George said, well, you guys get out of here. Jesus, it seems like I can't go away for a minute. Candy and Lenny stood up and went toward the door. Crooks called, Candy, huh? Remember what I said about hoeing and doing all jobs? Yeah, said Candy, I remember. Well, just forget it, said Crooks. I didn't mean it. Just fooling. I wouldn't want to go no place like that. Well, okay, if you feel like that. Good night. The three men went out of the door. As they went through the barn, the horses snorted and the halter chains rattled. Crooks sat on his bunk and looked at the door for a moment. And then he reached for the liniment bottle. He pulled out his shirt in the back, poured a little liniment on his pink palm, and reaching around, he fell slowly to rubbing his back. Okay, so at the end there, why does Crook suddenly say to Candy, uh, remember how I said, like, I could come work on the ranch for free and all that? Well, ooh, my lights are going out. How dramatic. Um, he says, I was just kidding. Uh, never mind. I don't want to do that after all. So why? Why does he say that? What happened? And that is chapter four.